Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's Rebecca Levis coming to you from San Diego, California, and we're studying Torah together. Now, we are in the home stretch of the five books of Moses. We are in the book of Devarim or Deuteronomy, and we are in the portion of scripture today called Akev. And we're going to be getting into some fantastic Hebrew words today, where you're going to see some really important connections between biblical concepts and these words. So if you have my favorite Hebrew word book, or just a plain notebook, where you can jot these words down and then put them in the back of your Bible, it will be very helpful in making connections between the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the New Testament, which is called the Brit Hadashah. So let's get started today. I'll share my screen and we'll jump right in. I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see through Hebrew lenses. And today we are in Akev, which means because or as a result of. And so where are we? Last week we ended talking about Moses giving the children of Israel final instructions before the new generation crosses the Jordan into Canaan. They're right across from the city of Jericho. And Moses is acting like a father to young children. And he's saying, remember, don't forget, remember these important things, just like any parent would teach their children. So before we get started, let me recite the typical prayer said prior to Torah study by our Jewish friends. It goes like this. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melaka Olam, Asher Kiddishano Be Mitzvotav, Vitzevanu La Asok, Be Torah, which means, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who blesses us with his commandments and commands us to busy ourselves in the words of Torah. Torah is our foundation, and then we build on it. So here we go. We're in the Book of Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verse 12, through chapter 11, verse 25. Now, that's a lot to cover. So today, I'm going to pick out the things that I think are important to me. I'm sure everybody who teaches on this teaches on different points of this. You can imagine 7, 8, 9, 10, 5 chapters to teach from. Um, so I hope you'll bear with me as I share things that are important to me and hopefully important to you as well. So what is the meaning of akev? Akev comes from the verb akav, or um, what we would call the root of um, Jacob's name, actually. And it means a heel. Why? Because the heel is what um, follows something. Like when we say in our uh, um, idioms today. It came on the heels of something. That means it's what followed or because of or as a result of. And it's also the word for reward. So I love the fact that this um, scripture talks about God wanting to give this new generation, 20 years old and younger, rewards when they get into the land of Canaan. So it also can be a negative effect if something negative is following you, that could be to act deviously or to overtake you for evil purposes. So um, you can see it can go either way. So the common theme, what happens following something or what comes after is the word because, right? So here's what happens and because of that, Here's what follows. So you can find that in our etymological dictionary right here, wherever you see those green um, brackets. That's where I'm telling you where to find it in this Hebrew study um, dictionary. And I use this in my Hooked on Hebrew class. So um, once you learn your 22 letters of Hebrew in a basic Hebrew class, then you can look the words up for yourself. So remember, I said this is also Jacob's name. So this is the people of Israel getting ready to go in and take what God promised, right? Jacob and the 12 tribes. So there's a little play on words here with Jacob or Israel going in to take over the land of Israel. 
Okay, so why was Jacob's name changed to Yisrael? Here is his name. Well, if you break down Israel's name, it's actually two uh, different words, Yashar and El, Yisrael, okay? And what does that mean? Well, Yashar means to go straight or to make things right. I love that. In other words, faithful to do what God is calling them to do. What were they to be? I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to multiply you. And you're going to be a blessing for the whole world. You're going to be a light to the nations. And it's important that they see that and follow and do God's will. So the instructions that Moses is giving them at this point is critical for them to understand to follow and to make straight, okay. So this is also, of course, the word L meaning God. So go straight for God's sake and for the sake of Israel. So there's also a book called Yasher, which means to go straight. And it's referenced three different times in the scriptures. And here they are here, if you wanna look them up yourself. And here's what the book of Yasher looks like. And here's where those references are. I have this book and it's a fantastic extra biblical book written um, like apocryphal books where you can find out a lot about the people of Israel and their history. So if you don't have that book, you might want to consider it uh, purchasing it for your Hebrew library. <laughs> okay, so God completed his work by bringing them out of Egypt showing them miracles, being faithful to them. Why? Because I give of his great love for the, the purpose of redeeming the world. And he was going to use the nation of Israel to be that light. So they were going to be a reward for the whole world. So see all the beauty in that one word, akav, ya Yaakov, Jacob's name, and then meaning a reward. So Moses was there giving him the big picture. And that's what I hope to give you here in this teaching. In the same way, because we love Yeshua, the Messiah, what follows is what? Good works. On the heels of saving faith comes good works. Okay, so they should follow us wherever we go. See that principle? And they're done in his power, the spirit, to lift up and glorify or make heavy. That's the word um, kabod, to make heavy God's name. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's workmanship. So we follow with good works created in the Messiah to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Did you know that? That he created you in advance for you and me to have certain things done in his name that we have the privilege and delight in doing. Oh, don't worry. If we fail, he'll give us a second chance. And if we keep failing, well, he'll give it to someone else. It's that simple. But don't you want it to be you? You know, I do. Okay, so let's continue. So the entire Bible is all about relationships between Israel and the surrounding nations, person to person, nation to nation, tribe to tribe, Moses to the people. Isaiah 40 says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and proclaim to her that her forced labor has been completed or fulfilled, Mila, filled full. So her guilt is pardoned for she has received from the hand of the Lord double for all her sins, chata, removal from the source of, relight, of life. That's what sin means. The world, the world is full of sin. And so God is using the Hebrew people as a reward. And if you follow that seed line all the way into the New Testament, we'll see that that seed was fulfilled in Messiah Yeshua. He paid 
for the sin of the whole world. And then he gives us that double blessing, free of sin and eternal life. That's the double reward. And so you see all of that in these words. So you might want to write down the word milah to mean filled full. Jesus filled full the Torah and its teaching. So I wanted to show you, um, Isaiah is speaking to the Israelites in Isaiah 40, verse 3. And we'll see that word yeshar show up in God comforting his people. And so you see, this is where this portion of Isaiah changes at Isaiah 40. It goes from warning, warning, here's what happens if you don't follow. But then he says, comfort, comfort my people. Okay, prepare the way. What's the way? He says, make straight a highway for our God. And here's the word yeshar, which I just said is part of Israel's name. Yisrael, well, here it is, make straight a way. Isn't that beautiful? And then what also I wanted to show you here is another word for a highway. Here's the word sila, mis la. It's a root word meaning highway, but also, did you know it's the root word for a ladder? Hmm, where have we heard that term ladder or sulam? Well, we heard that in the relationship to Jacob. So see, they're all tied together in this one verse, Isaiah 43. It's just boom, loaded with wordplay here. Make straight, and you see Jacob's uh, changed name, part of Israel's name, and then we see it tied back to Jacob with ladder, meaning a sulam, and it's the same as highway. So you can see Jacob, when he had that dream of the ladder, was that straight ladder up and down, showing a way being made into heaven. Wow, wow, wow. This is just unbelievable how all these things are related. Do you see why I love this language so much? Okay, back to the story. Now, Moses said, because you listen and keep guard his word, God will keep you. Now, again, let's look at some beautiful words. I hope you have your book next to you. If not, at least a piece of paper where you can jot these down. Moses is reminding them that this word Shema, to hear, isn't just a cognitive hearing in, by your ear. When they say Shema or hear, it demands a response. And it's assumed that you will respond by doing. So the word hear, Shema, also means hear and do. Don't you love that? So he says, if you will hear and do, what will be the outcome or the reward? He says, then God will guard you. His word will guard you. Here's the word for guard. Guard. Shamar. Shamar also means to protect, and it means a diamond. So think about that. A diamond is one of the most valuable jewels, and it's the same word for God guarding and keeping us. Why? Because we are his prized possession. And don't you love that? How did that get tied to diamond? Well, two reasons. One, it's valuable, but two, diamonds are hidden in the rock, just like we're hidden in the rock. And they have to be dug out and mined to find the value. And so that's what God's word is. We have to dig out the beauty of his word, like we would go mining for diamonds. It's also, interestingly enough, the word the guardhouse or a dungeon. So you see how they're related, hidden away? Okay, so they share two letters, the word Shema and Shamar, and it's the word for name. Isn't that interesting? Shem means 
a name. And so um, when we hear and obey, we're following God's commands. So see, all these words are related. It's like God's name is in them as they hear and keep his words, and then he protects them with those words. He guards and protects us when he hears Shema, our cry. You see, it's reciprocal. He commands and we hear, and then we cry out when we need him, and he responds and guards. Wow, that is what we call a covenant. That is foundational. So all these words need to be written down and put in your Bible today. So keeping and obeying God's words are considered doing mitzvot, and these are our good works. So in Judaism, the one who gets the reward is the one who completes the work. So if we look into the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, look at Philippians 1.6. He who began a good work, a mitzvah in you and me, will be faithful to what? Complete it. All right. You can see it right there. He gives us the reward of forgiveness of sin and eternal life. And then look at 40, uh, Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand and his arms shall rule for him. Behold, his reward, there's that word, is with him and his work, you and me, is before him. So see, Isaiah 40 is such a beautiful verse. You might write Isaiah 40 next to those key words when you log them in your Bible. So what is God's work? Well, he continues in Isaiah 40 and says he will be like a shepherd. This is why the Messiah in the New Testament is portrayed as the good shepherd. He feeds his flock. He gathers the little ones in his arms, and that word for arm is, look at this, zerah. It's also the word for seed. Why? Because you cast forth yara, seed, with your arm. So see, all these words should be written down and saved and seeing the connections. He carries them against his chest or next to his heart. And he gently leads them, the tender ones, the, the ones, um, the mother sheep. And don't you love that? He knows that they're tender and they need extra care. And so I love the fact that God uses all these word pictures here as a tender shepherd. And I wanted to put this picture when I went to Israel in 2019, when I was in Bethlehem, I came out of a restaurant and the little boy literally threw this lamb in my arms in Bethlehem. And I went, oh, oh my gosh, somebody quick take my picture. I'm in Bethlehem holding the lamb that saved me, the lamb of God. Isn't that what uh, John the Immerser said when he saw the Messiah coming? Behold, the Lamb of God. <sighs> That's so beautiful. So Deuteronomy 7.7, 7, Moses reminds them that Israel was the least of all nations. He chose them not because they were the greatest or the strongest, but they were actually the least. Why? He chose them because his love would be displayed in them and through them. And he wanted to keep the oath he promised to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or Avraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. They obeyed. God would extend his grace then to those who loved him and kept that covenant. Okay. So they, if they obeyed, God would extend his grace to those who loved him. And here's the word for grace. It's chanan. A cognate word related to grace is chanan, but with a different first letter. And that's where you get the name Canaan. So see, 
God is taking them by his grace, fulfilling the promise made to the patriarchs. And it's related to the word, the promised land, or Kanaan, or Canaan. So what is the oath that he promised? Well, it's the word Sheva, and it means to seven yourself. It's the number seven, and that means completion. So the oath was to bring them in, and God was fulfilling his oath. It was completing them or filling full the promise. And then we take it into the New Testament and realize that it would be done also there by the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah, fulfilling the promises to all those who came before him. And I want to show you this picture of seven. We're going to be doing this in great detail, by the way, when we start the cycle over again, October 27th, 22nd. Write that down. The new Torah cycle will begin then. We're going to be looking at the, the cycle of sevens all through the Bible. But I want to quickly show you here the manifestations of what we would be seeing fulfilled in the New Testament. Jesus, the Messiah, would bring wisdom, understanding, counsel, power, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord through his servant, which would be the Messiah. So this was fulfilling Isaiah 11, 2 of a righteous branch. So here's the seven branches. Here's a picture of the Messiah, the servant. This lamp lights all the others. So isn't that beautiful? And then another uh, cycle of seven we see is the seven blessings showing up as fruit. We see it in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Did you know there's seven fruits? Olives, pomegranates, barley, wheat, figs, honey, and grapes. And this is from the dates as well as bee honey. So this is date honey and bee honey. I just love that. And how about one more? There's seven enemies that God speaks about in Proverbs or the writings of the Tanakh. And it's found in 6, verse 17 through 19. What are those that separates and follows up God's permanent plan to seven his people? Well, Satan also has a lamp. And it looks like this. Isn't it interesting that there's seven enemies that will um, try to disarm everything God wants to do? Here it is. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood, heart that devises evil plans instead of God's plans. Isn't that interesting? It's right in the center where you see the servant. So there'll be the servant and the serpent always in conflict. Those are the two seed lines we've been following. And feet that are swift to run to evil, bearing false witnesses and ultimately separating brothers. So you see that it starts with haughty eyes. Well, there's a chiastic structure. Notice the word pride rhymes with divide. So this one will match this. Lying tongue will match false witnesses. Hands that shed blood will be done with evil intent. And it all comes from the one who hates the seed which is Satan. Okay, so first God said he would lay diseases and disasters upon their enemies. Don't fear them. Well, interesting when we go back to this lamp that we see much of this in our culture today. Do we not? We see it everywhere. And the whole point is to create division. Man lifting himself up in multitude of ways, I'm not going to list them. I think you can list them yourself. The object of Satan's purposes are to take what's prideful and be used to divide people. And we see that happening everywhere. So look at this. Do not say it's because of your righteousness 
are your own good works that God is blessing you. And this too today we see, we think, oh, you know, this is all about me. Look what I've done. Look how I've accomplished and look all of the wonderful things that I've done and how long I've served this country and la, 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 la. Well, don't think it's because of you. It's because God has blessed this nation. Yes, it's not perfect and it's done many things wrong in the name of power and even religion. However, why do you think everyone else in the world is trying to get into our nation if it isn't the greatest nation in the world? Okay, it started with our foundation, which was Judeo-Christian. Okay, so God was using Israel as a rod of judgment against these nations that started out being blessed from Noah, and then they went astray and started lifting themselves up and doing pagan practices till they became so corrupt that God destroyed them with the flood. And then he said he would also destroy them again. And he did it with fire and brimstone when we see that at Sodom and Gomorrah. And then it's gonna be shown again in the Battle of Armageddon, or what we're seeing in a lot of these movies today, the final battles. So God is going to use Israel as a rod of judgment. And I believe in the end days, we're also going to see God use Israel and God's people to show uh, this final battle victory. And it's going to be done in the power of God's strength, not in ours. So there were seven interesting, pagan nations that they would have to face, who are physically much stronger and mightier, but it would be a spiritual battle that God would win for them. Now Moses proved his point and listed their parents' past deeds that uh, showed their rebellion, the sin of rejection of his presence at Sinai. Remember that? How about the infidelity of the golden calf? The lust they wanted for meat until they ate it, it was coming out of their noses. They weren't grateful. The waters of Meribah that were bitter when they complained to Moses about their lack of water. How about the sin of the spies? Unbelief. How about Korah's rebellion? How about seduction of the Moabite women with their men and distrust of their future, future destiny? And they go, we should have never left Egypt. We want to go back. Wow. This is what Moses had been putting up with, with this first generation. And like I said last week, not one from that generation were left except Caleb and Joshua and Phineas that would go in. Okay. And some of the sons of Korah, by the way, which we'll see later in this teaching on Deuteronomy. Now, God promised to drive out the enemies. Now, he's done it in the past. He'll do it now, and he's going to do it again in the future. I like this quote. A wise person learns from their mistakes. A wiser person learns from others' mistakes. But the wisest is the one who learns from others' successes. This is why we look back in biblical history and we say, okay, what did people do right? What did they do wrong? Let's not repeat it. But because man has a sinful heart and that's what fights against the spirit in all of us, Moses said, don't think I'm driving them out to reward your righteousness. No, God's saying, I'm going to drive them out. Why? Why were they to go in and conquer these seven nations, and kill men, women, and children? Well, we're going to get into that. It seems harsh now from our perspective, but I think when you're done with Deuteronomy, you're going to see that God does not show partiality when people go their own way, and they're warned, and warned, and warned, and warned. There comes a day when a line is crossed, and the warnings stop, and there's judgment. So learn well from the past is the whole point. So remember Jesus' words to Satan? Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Satan looks at only the physical. And this is what we see the world looking at problems today through their eyes 
And yet those who believe in Yeshua and the Bible and prophecy are looking at world events through spiritual eyes, two different worlds. Moses told them to store up those words in their heart. And this is exactly what we're to do in this generation. Number one, believe God is faithful and true. Number two, store up his word in our heart. And then number three, love God and others with all your heart, mind, and strength as we see the day approaching. Now, there's always hope, even if those who came before us have rebelled or forgotten God. God still has a plan for this new generation, and I believe he has a plan for the next generation to bring that last dragnet, uh, of, dragnet of, uh, believers in before it's too late. So, um, this is why we have spiritual eyes and we go into our days, with our eyes wide open and our ears to the one who is speaking. And, uh, that's how we're to begin and end our days each day. So these are the words written to the sons of Korach. Korach's death was due to his rebellion. Let's look at Psalm 85, 10 through 13. It says, mercy and truth have met together. Okay, it's like God's mercy and his truth meet here in the middle of the mediator. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Look at righteousness and peace have kissed each other. So God's mercy and righteousness, which he pours out on us, along with his word, which is truth that brings peace, they have met, okay, through a mediator. And who is that mediator? Well, it's a picture of the bride and groom. We meet and we kiss. You see, there's the intimacy right here. And this is exactly what the Messiah did when he came into this world. In his mercy and in his righteousness, he died for you and I, in order that we might have truth and live in peace. Truth shall spring out of the earth, here it is, and righteousness shall look down ultimately from heaven. So as the world calls for peace right now, it is through the mediator right here. God shows mercy by giving us truth and then in the end, righteousness will look down as we all live in peace. So this is the beginning and the end picture, the big picture. This is what I'm giving everyone today, hopefully. Moses reminds them of the many times that he interceded for them. Now, he was on Mount Sinai 40 days twice. He didn't eat or drink. He foreshadowed Elijah and Yeshua, both of them. We're fasting 40 days, right? And this was a spiritual fast. And it said that they were satisfied in the end. Moses was even willing to remember, have his name blotted out of the book of life. Oh my gosh. Talk about the faithfulness of Israel and Moses. Blot outing, blotting out a name, I just wanted to show you, means to never mention the name again. Did you know that? And in Judaism, when someone even says the name Hitler or Haman, this is the past from the Tanakh with um, Haman and um, Esther. And then we see it now in the New Testament, right after World War II, right? In the Holocaust, they say this verse, Yamach Shemo Vezecho. And what they do is it means, may his name in memory be blotted out. So they spit sometimes and curse and say this. Well, you know what else they do? They take the first letter of these three words, and it comes up three letters in the word Yeshu. And they relate that to Yeshua, the Messiah, Jesus. And so in a negative way, did you know that they, when you speak about Jesus to a Jewish person, it reminds them of this verse, may his name and memory be blotted out. But I also remember Zechariah where he said, they will look on the one they have pierced and grieve. And this is a prophetic picture of the end days when the Messiah is revealed and their eyes are opened and they realize 
that the one that they have blotted out or spit on was the one that they actually should have been worshiping. So over the centuries, scholars have argued that this is equated to Jesus of Nazareth, and it's speaking of blotting out his name. So when we speak of Jesus, uh, just be sensitive to that with our Jewish brothers and sisters. Also, he reminded them of the many times that he interceded for them, okay? And uh, I already talked about that. So Yeshua, when he fasted, was feasting spiritually and was totally full spiritually. Well, Moses instructed Israel to store up the words of Torah because it's the same principle that we see Jesus doing. He went and he stored up spiritual words from the Father, okay, when he fasted. And so we see that pictured there as well. In John 5, 39, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them, the Torah, you have eternal life. But it is in these, the Torah, that bear witness of me. Of who? This is Yeshua speaking. And he quotes them. He says, oh yeah, you, you study all day the Torah, but it's in the Torah, the Tanakh, through the Torah and the Nevi'im, the prophets, and the Ketuvim, the writings, that they all point to me. Jesus was saying that about the Torah, about himself. Moses interceded for Israel just as the Messiah Yeshua interceded for those that he leads out of darkness and into the light. And this is the picture of God taking the people through Moses out of Egypt to bring them following the light out of the darkness and slavery. And this is the beautiful picture of the Messiah. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and don't be stiff-necked anymore. What does it mean to circumcise the heart? Now, physical circumcision isn't just um, of the flesh and, and isn't just a Jewish practice. It has a spiritual principle. It's a removal of I say the veil or an uncovering of the source of the seed. Have you ever thought about it that way? It can also be seen as when they're circumcised in covenant on the eighth day. It can be seen as you're saying this is a death to my flesh. I am now a child of the covenant. So when we have our hearts circumcised, which is what Rabbi Shaul, Paul, says circumcision isn't just of the flesh, but it's of the heart. This is what he's talking of. When we get born again, we die to self, to the flesh, and we receive the Holy Spirit into our heart. Okay? This is where we are circumcised, and it's done by the Holy Spirit. So see the beauty of all this? An interesting quote from Maimonides uh, his name is Mo Moses Ben Maimon, known as, to English-speaking audiences, as Maimonides or Rambam. So this is like a, uh, a, a shortening of this long name. So that's where you get Maimonides and Rambam. But he was the greatest Jewish philosopher in the medieval time around 11 1200s, and it's widely read today. The Mishneh Torah, his 14 volume of the Jewish law, established him as the leading rabbinic authority of his day. Here's what he said. The removal of the foreskin in circumcision is like removing coveting, which is pride. Okay, we want our own way and restricts holiness. Isn't that interesting? So what they're saying is that restriction that is circumcised is taking away our own pride so that we can then be used by God. So see, it's that same kind of principle, a removing of dying to the flesh. So I thought that was interesting. I wanted to point that out. Deuteronomy 7, 16 says, you are to destroy all the people 
that the Lord hands over to you. Now that word means to eat up or consume. And it says, take no pity on them or they will become a snare. Don't be tempted to compromise. It always starts with a lie that we swallow or consume. So he says here, don't, you're to destroy them, consume them. Because why? Because if we compromise, then we too will swallow a lie and be deceived. Does that sound familiar? How about the Garden of Eden? Moses tells them that God brought them there to humble and test them to see what's in their heart. He humbled them until they were what? Hungry and thirsty. And then what did he do? He fed them. He gave them manna and he gave them water from the rock. Okay. So that's why Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 8.3. What, what man says, Moses said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from God's mouth. So there's the connection. Yeshua was quoting the Torah. He promised them a land of streams flowing with water. Okay, streams and water, one of the words for water or stream is necha, necha, nun, het, lamed, also is a word for inheritance, because why? It comes from heaven, touches the top of the mountain, like the Torah, and flows down to the lowest point. That's an inheritance. This is a picture of God's word flowing down to all people from the highest to the lowest. It misses no one. Isn't that a beautiful picture? And that's why we see a river flowing in the book of Revelation in the new Jerusalem. That's our inheritance. Do you see the beauty of that? So blessed are those who hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness, for they will be filled full. So Jesus was the king of righteousness. That's one of his names. And he filled full the Torah and expounded on it and became that lamb of God who was crucified. He said, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And this is what Jesus said in John 7, 38. And the prophet Amos in chapter 811 says, A time is coming, says the Lord Adonai. I will send famine over the land. What? Gee, what are we worrying about today in our culture? Famine, floods, pestilence. They said what? Lake Mead is down 20 feet in one year. I'm going to send a famine over the land, not of bread or a thirst for water. And what are we worrying about right now? The heating up of our culture, global warming. We're not going to have bread. We're not going to have vegetables. We're not going to have fruit. We're not going to have trees. We're not going to have water. It said in the end days, a third of all those living in the water will die and a third of all man and a third of all birds. Hello, Amos said, a time is coming that there'll be a famine, not of bread and water, but what? Hearing and obeying the words of Adonai. Warning, warning, warning. I just see this red light going round and round and round. Warning, warning. God told them they'll drive out the enemies little by little. Why? Because otherwise, if it's all at once, the wild ones will come and be too numerous for them. So it's a process of maturing a group of people so that they can be strong when the enemies come against them. And taking something on before they're spiritually ready. And this is true. This is a spiritual principle. If we take on something before we're spiritually ready to take it on, it can backfire. God knew they needed to go through a process of strengthening. 
so that their courage and confidence would be in him, not in themselves. And isn't this true today? Oh my gosh, I take this to heart. I go, Lord, give me courage and confidence, not in myself, but as I understand your word, as I see its purpose, its patterns, its principles, then help me, Lord, to walk them out before the world, my sphere of influence. So it takes God's truth established over time. God was maturing them so that everywhere they set their foot, they'd be ready and responsible for handling the challenges, every new enemy. And boy, they're just coming one after another today, aren't they? Challenging our, how we raise our kids, challenging marriages, challenging uh, the next generation through abortion and the seeds that are meant to be given as a gift. Who knows how many Moses have been destroyed? Who knows how many possible prophets? Who knows how many leaders were murdered at the hands of man? And this is what we saw in the pagan culture then, and we're seeing it today. Deuteronomy 11, verse 13 through 21, is like part two of the Shema. So last week's portion was like the, the Shema, the love God with all your heart, mind, and strength. This is like the part two of the Shema. If you do this, then blessings will follow. But if you don't, then curses. Now, this is why I said in the very beginning, way back at Mount Sinai in Exodus, there were two sets of tablets. The first set came with no curses. However, because of their unfaithfulness, God had to take away the blessing of the firstborn, which should have been through Reuben. And then he had to give them a second set of tablets. And this set came with consequences due to disobedience. And here we see it showing up here in this chapter of Deuteronomy 11. And there it is. It's an if or then. So, and if you don't obey, you're going to be seduced. You're going to turn aside. And then what will happen? No rain no fruit, and you will be exiled from your good land. America, wake up. Lord, pour out your spirit on America in Jesus' name. Pour out your spirit like you did in the revivals of old. Lord, pour out your spirit. Maranatha, come quickly. And church, it's not a time to be hopeless. It's not a time to be discouraged. This darkness that we see around us is the greatest moment. Rise up this generation and next. Rise up and take your place in God's kingdom work. That's my purpose. That's my passion uh, to speak. To the next generation to my children and in the, the church and um, those who are listening online is to share these important truths those who love him are led by god and fed by god and there's many twists and turns along the way church but greatness church in this moment of time is a road leading to the unknown just like Noah, just like Moses, just like Abraham, just like the first disciples who followed Yeshua. And that's no different for you and I. It takes trust. It takes years to mature and build this trust, which is what Moses was trying to teach this next generation. But it takes seconds to break, <laughs> a lifetime to repair. You see, the first generation didn't trust God. They all fell. But now, Moses is begging this next generation to trust God in all things. So I'll leave you with these questions. What is God requiring of you and of me? I'm going to quote Micah 6, 8 as bookends. So we get the Shema in the beginning. 
And now I'm going to end with the prophet Micah. Here's what he said. Here's what God requires of us to love justice, make things right, whether it's between you and friends, you and in your marriage, or you and God, make things right. Love what is just and right. Two, love grace. Be gracious to those around you. Speak to truth, but don't do it in anger. Stay consistent, stay um, conscious of God's teaching and do it in a loving, gracious manner. Not for revenge and not to um, take things into your own hands, but wait on the Lord, pray, feed on his word and listen, Shema, and then do. And three, walk humbly before God. Don't lift yourself up, but lift him up in everything you do and say. And in lifting up others as well as God, we're lifted up to accomplish the purposes of his kingdom. And that's how I will end today. So I don't think I could have said it any clearer. I pray that you will subscribe to this channel and please share this with your families, your children, the next generation, so that they can see the bigger picture. That it's only as we allow the Messiah to have rule of our life that we see victory, that we'll see God's purpose fulfilled in our lives and in our children and grandchildren. If we stand firm on that foundation of the Torah and the Brit Hadashah. When it comes together and everybody sees for the first time all their mistakes and repents and says, have mercy on me, King of Righteousness, and fill me with your Holy Spirit, your truth, so that I might walk in peace. Join me next week for another great teaching of Torah. Shalom Alekha.